I want to hear firsthand what operations were really like back in the Victorian times. So I thought, what better way to do this than to travel back in time? all the way back to the year 1867. And where better to do this than at the old operating theatre in London? Are you ready to join me? Turn the hand of your pocket watch back to the 19th century. Close your eyes, hold on tight, and imagine the Victorians. Surgery will begin at 12 o'clock on the dot as always. In order to ensure we get the best light coming in from the ceiling, that will be my surgeon, Mr. Lister, a huge pioneer in medicine who invented antiseptic surgery. Now, I want to know what this means and why this was such a big turning point in medical history. Come on, let's go take a look around. Back in the Victorian times, operating theatres were traditionally designed as a theatre so that a large number of medical students could gather in close to the patient in order to closely observe the operation and learn from the surgeon. Ah! You must be my new assistant! Splendid! Uh, do come down, please. The gallery is for my students only. Uh, no, I'm not. No, 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 no. Down you come. Chop, chop. <laughs> if you'll pardon the pun. I'm sorry, it's been a long week. Come along! If you like this video, please hit the thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Well, you need to wash your hands if you're going to take part in one of my operations. In our time, it's easy for us to take our knowledge of germs for granted. We've known about it all our lives, it's become so ingrained in our minds. But imagine, just for a minute, if you had never heard of germs before. How would you know that washing your hands would help stop you from getting sick? Germs are invisible after all. Well, this is what life was like for everyone right up until the mid 19th century. Thankfully, at this point in time, things are starting to change. Who did you say you are again? I'm Lauren, and I've no experience in medicine or operations whatsoever. I'm just here to ask you all about your pioneering work in antiseptic surgery. Right. Well, not to worry though. Uh, learn as you go on the job, and you won't be on your own. There'll be another five assistants joining us shortly. Great. I'm glad to hear it. So, Mr. Liston, I've heard that you have the nickname of the fastest knife in the West End. Is that true? Lister. My name is Joseph Lister, not Robert Liston. Now, that man died almost 20 years ago, and I know that we have a very similar name. We're both Scottish, we both live in a similar time, but we're very different people. I mean, that man had a 300% mortality rate in one operation. I suppose actually now you've mentioned his name, he would be a very good place to start. I tell you what, come over to the operating table and we'll take it from there. Come on! Now up until recently, surgery has been very basic, with no anaesthetic whatsoever. Anaesthetic being something that numbs pain? Absolutely, numbs it or puts you to sleep completely. So the patients would be wide awake during the procedure with no anaesthetic whatsoever. Ouch. Ouch indeed. That meant that speed was of the essence, which meant that our surgeons could only do a number of different procedures. One of them being amputation. Now, Mr. Liston, that you mentioned, known as the fastest knife in the West End, was well known for his speed. In fact, supposedly, he could take off a limb in 28 seconds. Yes. Now, some people say he was quite the show off and would say to his audiences, time me, gentlemen, time me. Wow. Sounds like an interesting chap. Well, yes. Now, some people, you might think that he sounds a bit reckless, but actually, he was well-renowned and people wanted to be operated on by him. 
Some people that would actually camp out in his waiting room for days because he had very good survival rates. On his surgery table, only one in ten people died. Now, at St Bartholomew's, a little further away, for slower surgeons, one in four died on the operating table. Wow! But if there was no pain relief, then how did the surgeon get the patient to stay on the operating table? Well, that would be one of your main jobs, and as an assistant, to hold the patient down. But you had to be careful where you put your hands. <laughs> I'll explain. Come and lie down on the operating table, and you can be the patient for this next story. I don't know if I like the sound of this. Now, this story didn't actually take place in this operating theatre, but it did happen nonetheless. So imagine you're in here with a broken leg, you're in agony, and the infection is beginning to set in. All of a sudden, the doors swing open and in walk a group of men in blood-stained aprons, carrying dirty tools, and stand around you. And then, in a theatrical manner, in comes Liston, addresses his spectators by saying, Time me, gentlemen! Time me! But as Liston is choking away, he doesn't notice the fingers of his assistant and he chops two of them off. Then, and in his hurried state as he carries on, he turns around and cuts the tailcoat of another one of his assistants and he goes into a state of shock. Oh, enough. Okay, stop, stop. But I don't understand. You said he had a 300% mortality rate. So does this mean that the patient and both the assistants died? Yes. Now, the patient and the assistant that lost the two fingers died later on in a ward due to infection. And the assistant that had his tail coat cut, well, a few days later, he died from shock. Ouch. Ouch, indeed. Quite the fiasco. But luckily, as of 1846, we started using anaesthetic, which means us surgeons could take our time because our patients would be fast asleep. So surgery becomes much safer, but this still doesn't save patients from getting an infection. Uh, no. You see, yes, they survived the operation, but they're likely to die from infection in a ward afterwards. Just like Robert Liston's patients. Precisely. Now, this comes on to be known as ward fever. And surgeons believed, quite wrongly, that it was the bad air against the wounds that would make them infected. So, the bed linen tended to be covered in blood. Hands of surgeons tend to be washed afterwards. Surgical tools were not washed. And most surgeons wore a frock coat or apron covered in blood to show off their experience. Oh, sounds gross. But I don't understand. It sounds as if most patients died from having an operation either way. So why agree to have the operation in the first place? Why put yourself through the trauma of it all? Well, a good question. That is because to come and have an operation here is a last resort. And for the women, because this operating theatre is just for women, that come here, they see it as having a chance to carry on. Because after all, there is a chance. Do you have to pay for the surgery? Oh, no, no, no. Surgery is free. You see, it is a way for our surgeons to give back to the next generation. After all, we do for compassion, not gain. This is a place of learning and growth. Speaking of learning and growth, when did all of this start to change? Well, for that, follow me. Well, in 1864, I read about a French chemist called Louis Pasteur. Pasteur's work was all about small cells called microorganisms, which lived on objects and in the body, but can be removed. 
microorganisms being germs. Absolutely, his germ theorem. Now this gave me the idea that germs could be causing infections. I thought, wait a minute, that means that the best way to stop infection is to find a chemical that will kill the germs. Ah, got it. Then I began experimenting with different chemicals to see which one was best to kill germs. It turns out it's carbolic acid. And so we start washing our hands with it and washing down all of the surgical instruments. Wow. And does it have a name? It does. Sterilisation. It's much better to get rid of the germs that are already there. That's amazing. And this simple act helps save lives. Absolutely, yes. I mean, my mortality rate went from, what, 46% down to 15%. Wow. That is amazing. So, other surgeons followed your lead, right? No. Unfortunately, not all surgeons want to go down the carbolic acid route, as it dries out the skin and they say it slows down the recovery of their patients. One medical magazine, known as The Lancet, actually wrote an article warning people about me. But don't worry, I have my friends and allies spreading the word about the good carbolic acid. Well, thank you, Mr. Liston, so much. It's been an honour to meet you. Uh, Lister. Lister. Yes, sorry. That's quite all right. It happens all the time. Now, you just wait there, and I will go and find you your apron, because, my goodness, it's already quarter to the hour, and surgery will begin on the dot. Wait there. Oh, dear. Right. I think I'd best be getting off then, because I'm not sure I'm really cut out for surgery. So, have you got your pocket watches up ready? Because it's time to turn the clocks forward this time, and we better make it quick. Close your eyes, hold on tight, and think of home. Oh, right there, here is your nice clean apron. Right, send in the 